Welcome back to Watch the Bookerman and to episode number 86 of Paul Heyman's TNA. And today we're going to go through the fallout week to Sacrifice 2011. An end of an era really, something that I'm going to get into a bit more later. But specifically, we begin with a video package focusing on the main event from Sacrifice. A series of stills from Bobby Lashley and Kurt Angle versus the Kings of Wrestling. Which of course saw the return of of Sting. He halted outside involvement from the other New Age members, Jimmy Jacobs and Tyler Black. With the Kings of Wrestling now missing their numbers advantage, it came down to Bobby Lashley and Chris Hero, and Lashley pinned Hero in the middle of the six sides. Following the match, however, after helping his partner back to his feet, Kurt Angle hit Bobby Lashley with an angle slam onto the World Heavyweight Championship. A preemptive strike, perhaps, Marrow and Taz welcome viewers to the show and again this is the end of an era. I've not actually signed the deal yet but this is the last episode that we will do on Spike. There was a comment a few weeks ago, someone commented on the ratings and saying that really we needed to move to a bigger broadcaster if we were to continue to grow and that's basically what I'm doing. So the Spike era ends tonight and provided nothing goes dramatically wrong, we will sign a deal with MTV to start next week. The same network as Evolve, so everything on the same network it's under the same Viacom umbrella so not too big of a move but it does give us the opportunity to potentially do a special episode next week and that's what tonight's going to be about building towards advancing a couple of storylines starting another one and it's a decent way to open the show as Kurt Angle then comes out to offer his explanation and he wastes no time Bobby Lashley's going to want to hear this so why didn't he come to the ring and let him say it to his face after the World Heavyweight Champion took him down at the end of Sacrifice. It's no surprise that Lashley is quickly out to join him. He wants answers. Kurt says that since Lashley came to TNA, they've been at odds with each other. You can literally trace it back to Bobby Lashley's first night in the company. Last week when Kurt's focus was on teaming with Lashley to help him get revenge over the Kings of Wrestling, he instead made it clear that Kurt's title was still on his mind. It was only a throwaway line in the promo that Bobby Lashley claimed he was just seconds away from becoming the champion before the Kings of Wrestling attacked him back in January but Kurt knows what Lashley was getting at there and simply he had to get to Lashley before Lashley got to him they know where the path lead in those two in the ring once again with the world heavyweight championship on the line and Lashley has no qualms with this he says you're damn right that I want the title he adds that he was seconds away from taking it in January recapping that where this all began as the two go face to face almost looking as if they're ready to rekindle hostilities there and then Paul Heyman comes down to calm the situation regardless of what happens after tonight they can't start fighting each other because they're teaming once again tonight Paul Heyman, of course, doesn't give a damn that these two clearly don't like each other and the fact they've got physical against each other already because they will face Tyler Black and Jimmy Jacobs of the New Age, the two guys who tried to screw them in that unsanctioned match at Sacrifice. They'll get their chance to get their hands on them. Gaining heat to the storyline, an 81 in a segment with Kurt Angle and Paul Heyman rated on Entertainment isn't actually that good, but I'm happy to see all those green notes, so I'm not going to complain too much. We then follow up with Loki back in action, defeating Tyson Dukes in 7 minutes and 4 seconds by pinfall with a Warriors Way. Decent performance from Key, and throughout the match we just talk about his ambitions to become the number one contender to the X Division Championship and after we saw Tyler Black defeat Roderick Strong in Strong's rematch at Sacrifice it does seem like it is time for a new contender and after the match we get confirmation of that basically Loki standing tall another in an ever-growing list of victories since his return to the company and if you look at his record compared to anybody else who might have their sights set on the X Division title it's a no-brainer that he should be the next contender as his arm is raised, so Calval joins Loki in the ring. Val confirms, as we all expected, Loki will be the number one contender to the X Division Championship at Slammiversary, a match that I think is going to be really great at that pay-per-view, the first time he faces Tyler Black inside a TNA ring, live on pay-per-view. Loki says that ever since he returned to TNA at Destination X, he's had his eye on that X Division title. Tonight, he'll also be keeping a close watch on the main event. 
because Tyler Black will be in action in that match. And this is the first match confirmed for Slammiversary. We then go to the back where Jimmy Jacobs and Tyler Black are shown in the locker room of the New Age. And they're speaking about tonight's main event. Black gives a little comment on Loki being named as number one contender. But downplays any idea that he might be afraid of that challenge. He's confident as always. Jacobs notes that the Kings of Wrestling aren't with them tonight. They're on the lookout for Sting because they know he'll be lurking when it comes time for tonight's main event. Before he can say much more, however, there is a bang on their door, barging into the room, Flash now joins the rest of the New Age, first confronting Jacobs before turning to Delray and the others. Flash has nothing to say, she doesn't get physical, and basically just the look on her face tells us that she wants answers. Jimmy Jacobs says that this was nothing personal, her fellow New Age members just did what was best for the New Age, it had to be done and there are no hard feelings. Alyssa Flash gives little away, still doesn't react, still doesn't speak, but as she leaves the room, she takes a moment to specifically make her feelings clear towards Miss Chiff, most disappointed in her long-term partner, former Knockouts Tag Team Champions. She shakes her head and storms out of the room, Miss Chiff looking to the ground. Clearly, this is something that they didn't necessarily want to do. For the greater good of the project, it's clear that Jacobs still wants Sarah Del Rey to be the Knockouts Champion. We then go into the second match of the night, Madison Rain defeating Brooke in 5 minutes and 32 with a reverse STO. It's not that good of a match, but Madison Rain puts in a solid performance. The Amazon at ringside doesn't get involved, but of course her presence always, always has an effect on a Madison Rain match. Decent reaction from the crowd, but terrible wrestling. After the match, Madison Rain takes a microphone from ringside, and from the look on her face, despite the win, she is again ready to air her grievances. After making her public complaint last week, Rain says that it is now clear that nobody is listening to her. Not only that, but whenever she does hear somebody in the back talking about her, they seem to think that the Amazon is the only reason that she's picking up victories, even though she just stands on the outside. She was the queen of the mountain long before the Amazon came along, and she deserves more respect. Coming out from the back, Awesome Kong makes her first appearance since lockdown, somewhat to the surprise of Madison Rain. Confident though with her Amazon beside her, Rain gets in the face of Kong and asks her who the hell she thinks she is to interrupt her. However, Kong quickly makes it clear that her focus isn't on Madison Rain, but rather the Amazon. Kong steps to Amazon, which further angers Madison Rain. She wants to be the star of the show, and she has been overshadowed by the potential of what could happen between these two women. With the two Goliaths, I've said go face to face. Obviously, the Amazon is significantly taller than her, but Rain withdraws her Amazon from the situation, continuing to bemoan her own lack of spotlight, and Awesome Kong is then left in the ring. She's made her intentions very clear. We then get an interview with Jay Lethal, Jerry Barash asking him about his match with Samoa Joe, which is next. Lethal talks about his history with Joe. He learns so much from being in the ring with him from the very, very early stages of his career. Tonight gives him the chance to show how far he's come, the level that he knows he is capable of competing at. He knows things haven't gone very well for him recently, but this is the night to get him back on track. With Joe coming off a defeat at Sacrifice, however, he knows that he won't be in a good mood and it will not be easy. Jay is then asked for a comment on Brian Danielson's victory over Abyss in the Monsters Ball, something he wasn't able to do, and Lethal admits it was difficult to watch. He doesn't have anything to say other than that. Rather than to congratulate Brian Danielson, Lethal then looks to wrap up the interview, but Barash asks one more question as he looks to make his excuses. Maria is in the building tonight, but won't be joining him at ringside. JB asks if there's any update regarding their wedding and the general situation of their relationship. A bit of a prying question, and Lethal, perhaps fair enough really, takes offence to this. He wants to talk about this even less than he wanted to talk about Brian Danielson's win, and he walks off very unhappy with the line of questioning. Jerry Brush a little bit out of order there, it has to be said, but the fall of Jay Lethal's storyline has started with this segment, and we also advance Brian's next step. We then get a video package which looks back at Sacrifice's Ring of Honor World Championship match. Austin Aries and Samoa Joe were evenly matched once again during this contest, but we see that Aries decided to use the Ring of Honor World Championship, the physical title, to knock Samoa Joe out when the referee wasn't looking, and he picked up the victory. The nature of the win, of course, causing much controversy. Later tonight, Austin Aries will speak about his win, 
But first, Samoa Joe will be in action against Jay Lethal. With Aries beating Joe, I just wanted to make clear before Joe's match that it wasn't a clean defeat for him because, of course, he's somebody who you always want to keep looking strong. And he does so in this, despite being off his game. A 68 really isn't the level that we've come to expect from Samoa Joe, but he does win in a match that had good heat and decent wrestling. 15 minutes 11. I wanted it to be 14, but the match angle ratios were off. But he hits a muscle buster, and it's very important that he bounces straight back with a victory. And Jay Lethal, looking pretty dejected, goes to offer Samoa Joe a handshake. While he was defeated, there's no doubt that he put in a great performance to last 15 minutes with a pissed off Samoan submission machine. And Joe does reciprocate the gesture. The commentators discussed that we are now into a five match long losing streak for Jay Lethal, having started the year undefeated. Clearly, a couple of months ago, something went very, very wrong. Attention then turns to the entrance way as Maria Canellis makes her way down to the ring. We've not seen her for a while. She's not been at ringside with her fiance in recent weeks, perhaps coinciding with those issues that he's had. Maria asks Jay how long he's going to keep doing this. Sensing this isn't his place to get involved, Samoa Joe leaves the ring, leaving them two to it. Maria calls Jay Lethal out on accepting defeat and failure, but says there's something else that he needs to accept. Jay asks Maria not to do this, not now, but she says that it's time that he was honest with the fans that he claims to love so much. When Lethal says nothing, Maria takes it upon herself to reveal that she broke off their engagement, the wedding isn't happening, and Jay needs to stop pretending that everything is fine between them. His whole life is falling apart around him, and he needs to get his head out of the sand and accept that. So a bombshell from Maria that the wedding is no longer going to happen. That's why she's been absent from TV recently. And while we all know what Maria Canellis' character became in later years, at this point in her career, she'd only really been the ditzy character on WWE. Then she came to TNA as Jay Lethal's love interest. So it's something that we've not seen from her before. But having seen how her career unfolded post WWE, it's something we definitely know she is capable of. But while it's not a surprise to anybody hearing it now, Maybe back then, seeing Maria Canellis be so stern and so strong with Jay Lethal should hopefully create an impactful moment to end the first hour. We then come back to Austin Aries and the American Wolves coming out, the ROH guys who were victorious at Sacrifice, and of course, they want to rub that in everybody's faces. Aries runs down their opponents, Samoa Joe and Bear Money. If they're the best that TNA has to offer, then ROH proved that they are levels above and they have nothing to worry about. There he says that everything is falling to place and after showing his guys up on pay-per-view, Paul Heyman had no choice but to finally agree to let them speak their minds uninterrupted. Aries begins to talk about then how this is only just the beginning and that their group is going to continue to expand and get stronger. While Paul may have agreed to let Austin Aries speak, AJ Styles certainly hasn't. Pointing out that he's never trusted Paul Heyman, AJ says that he isn't surprised that he's already bending the knee to these ROH guys but... AJ isn't going to let that happen. Aries laughs this off, asking if he's going to bring out his buddies from Bear Money and the Forefathers to come and save him again, because if that's the case, then they're ready to fight. AJ points out that he is far from friends with any of those guys, but at least they understand what TNA means to the wrestlers. Aries won't like it, but he needs to accept that TNA is the only reason that he is relevant and the only reason that anybody is listening to what he has to say right now. Next week is a new era for TNA, and he wants to fight all three of them. With that challenge laid down, the three begin to circle AJ Styles, looking to get some early shots in. However, wrestling's greatest tag team run down to make the save, and they will team with AJ Styles on next week's show. The three men ending up standing tall. Hass and Benjamin are pretty new to the company, but clearly they've taken to it very quickly, and AJ and Austin Aries both doing well on the microphone there, giving us a very solid segment. We then head to the back, and Claudio Castagnoli improvising. I wanted this scripted, but Hero complains if it's scripted, but because both of them were speaking, I've unscripted both of them. I had a feeling that Castagnoli it wouldn't be too great without a script. They're still on the lookout for Sting in the back. As the search continues, they are approached by Jeremy Borash. He asks them about their first defeat in a duo in TNA. They looked unstoppable before Sunday, but Chris Hero points out that Sunday's match was unsanctioned and that means it ain't on their TNA records. They are still undefeated. And in case Jeremy Borash has missed it, 
they're still the tag team champions. Claudio adds that they'd have won at Sacrifice if it wasn't for Sting creeping out of the shadows to screw them over, and that's exactly what they're here to sort out. They're pissed off, they're looking for Sting, and they don't have time for JB's questions. Heading into a dark, shadowy area of the building, here on Castagnoli, call out for Sting to show his face. They're certainly not giving up in their attempts to find the icon Sting. Daisy Hayes of the New Age is then defeated by Sarita in 7 minutes and 33 with a double underhook powerbomb and this comes after a botched interference from Miss Chiff. She was successful in helping Sara Del Rey defeat Alyssa Flash on Sunday but tonight not quite so cohesive with Daisy Hayes and the two women have great chemistry which gives us a very solid match. Happy with that overall. The game calls it a poor match. I don't think that that's the case at all. Another win for Sarita that she much needed but the focus after the match is on Daisy Hayes and Mischief. Mischief returning. She isn't somebody who shows concern for others very often but given that she was the one who cost Daisy Hayes, she comes into the ring and checks on her, helping her back to her feet. Hayes is understanding. She's not going to rock the boat between these two as she really wants to be friends with Mischief. Coming out from the back, Alyssa Flash confronts Mischief in the ring, now away from the big group of the New Age. She obviously wants to put that pressure on Mischief again, but she again says nothing, instead looking deep into the eyes of her former friend and partner, stepping in on Mischief's behalf. Daisy Hayes tells her to get over it, the new age is bigger than any one person and she needs to quit her complaining. Flash looks at Hayes and immediately drops her where she stands with a right hand. With no one else now between the two former Knockouts Tag Team Champions and longest standing members of the new age, don't forget, Mischief refuses to make eye contact with Alyssa Flash, her head going straight down, leaving the ring and heading up the ramp. Remaining in the six sides, Flash gives her first words since the defeat. Off microphone, she simply asks Miss Chiff, why? Moving on from that, Marrow and Taz introduce a video package which recaps the Monsters Ball from Sacrifice, where Brian Danielson picked up the biggest win of his career against Abyss, leaving Father James Mitchell in complete shock. A series of stills tell the story of that match. Of course, Abyss will have taken control of a lot of it due to his proficiency with weapons, but Brian was able to overcome him and the most decisive of victories possible, make Abyss pass out in the middle of the ring. Following the package, Marrow and Taz put over this landmark victory for Brian Danielson. We really want to hammer home that this is a huge win and nobody has been able to stop Abyss like that previously. They then send over to an interview with the American Dragon, who is banged up. We're not going to try and downplay how much that match took out of him, and that's why he's not in action tonight. But he speaks about that victory over Abyss, saying that he may be the only person in TNA not surprised that he picked up a win. From experience, he can confirm that Abyss is as big, as tough, and as dangerous as they say he is, and with all those weapons in his hand, there is nobody who hits harder. However, Brian says that he is a smarter wrestler and simply a better wrestler than the monster Abyss. Put any stipulation on top, they're still inside these six sides. It is still a wrestling match at the end of the day. Chrissy asks if there were any doubts at all from Brian. Surely he must have been slightly trepidatious stepping into the monster's ball with Abyss. He's beaten everybody other than Kurt Angle in the last two years. Surely he couldn't have been that confident. Danielson says, however, that he will always back his own ability in the ring and he doesn't feel like anybody and he includes the World Heavyweight Champion in that can match him when it comes to professional wrestling. So a very confident promo, name dropping Kurt Angle specifically and obviously Brian Danielson in line for a huge push after such a convincing victory, gaining heat to his storyline, improvising well and I'm really happy with that as a promo rating for Brian Danielson, definitely seen the positive effects of these victories he's been getting. Returning from the break, Mickey James comes down to the ring. The commentator is putting over that she has an announcement to make following her victory over Tara at Sacrifice. However, before we get to hear that, at the bottom of the ramp, she is jumped from behind by the woman she defeated at the pay-per-view, Tara. While she doesn't know what Mickey is about to announce, she isn't willing to let her former partner move on from her just yet screaming at Mickey as she continues to beat her down at ringside. Tara makes it clear this isn't over. She then launches Mickey into the steel steps. Now Mickey is unable to fight back. She's been beaten down so severely. Tara can take a microphone and tells Mickey that she doesn't get to decide when this is done between them. Next week on the New Era show, she's challenging Mickey to a rematch where this time 
anything goes. Myro and Taz then react to this challenge, putting over the start of the new era next week and what better match to have on that show as well as AJ Styles and WGTT versus the Ring of Honor guys than Mickey James and Tara, one of the best possible knockouts matches that we can put on and I really want next week's show to be a showcase of everything in TNA. That's something I did on the very, very first episode, January 2010, but now this is another chance to show how far we've come and show how talented this roster is and I'm really, really looking forward to that show as, like I've said, the start of a new era will really see the lay of the land on that show and hopefully we deliver because what I've got planned I think is going to be a very very good show hopefully it reflected in the ratings we then head to the office of Paul Heyman and he is confirming those matches and promoting that next show we really want to promote the hell out of this big show next week he says that there is no way that Mickey doesn't accept Tara's challenge after that beatdown so he's going to confirm that match also AJ and WGTT versus Aries and the Wolves, Mickey James and Tara, anything goes. Before then, however, there is an episode of TNA Evolve, and on that show, as well as promoting further next week's huge episode of Impact, he also has a major announcement that will affect TNA Evolve going forward. Before Paul can give any more details, Aries, Richards and Edwards walk into his office. Aries says that Paul is a brave man not having any security outside his door, especially in these uncertain times. Heyman says that his door is always open to TNA roster members, but for these guys, he may just have to call security. Aries tells him that that won't be necessary after he beats Samoa Joe on a TNA pay-per-view. Heyman can't afford to not keep these guys around. They're the talk of the wrestling business. And speaking of business, with this big show next week, he has somebody who knows Paul Heyman very well, who wants to come and deliver some home truths to Paul. He's going to be there, so he expects to see Paul Heyman in the middle of the ring, with his mouth closed and his ears open. Paul Heyman, of course, intrigued. The three men leave the office, and another thing to set up for next week, while Austin Aries doesn't do well when improvising his dialogue, it is a good segment rating, and we advance a few storylines as well, so all good there. We then go into the main event, not as good as I'd hoped I will admit, but it's still a solid main event and Bobby Lashley and Kurt Angle defeat Jimmy Jacobs and Tyler Black in 14 minutes and 6 when Kurt Angle makes Jimmy Jacobs tap out to an ankle lock, Kurt Angle head and shoulders above everybody else, Jimmy Jacobs the weak link, still getting a 59 which to say he's not been pushed so strongly and barely been used as an in-ring wrestler for the last two years, it's not really that bad and he was off his game so he could have done even better there, getting the crowd buzzing and Jimmy Jacobs and Tyler Black showing great chemistry, in a sense the way we've booked Jimmy Jacobs as a non-wrestler you could argue that this is almost a handicap match against the heels, but what we want tonight to be is a showcase of Tyler Black. While his team does lose, he is so effective against two of the very best wrestlers in the company. He brings a completely different style to each of them. Kurt Angle's technicality, Bobby Lashley's powerhouse style, but Tyler Black's speed, agility, and his ability to essentially evade their offense. The performance of 77, Tyler Black going above and beyond, and it's almost more a spotlight of him than anybody else, which considering the other guys are competing for the World Heavyweight Championship, hopefully gives him a nice rub. We really want to continue this idea of Tyler Black helping elevate the X Division Championship. As Kurt Angle returns to his feet having made Jimmy Jacobs tap out, it's pretty predictable what happens next. He is taken down by Bobby Lashley who hits a huge spear in retaliation almost immediately for Angle's actions at sacrifice. The commentators point out that turnabout is fair play. Angle certainly can't have any complaints about that but this may not have been the smartest decision as the New Age's Chris Hero and Claudio Castagnoli begin to make their way down to the ring. Hero takes a microphone as Lashley gears up to fight both of them and tells him that this doesn't need to come to a two-on-one beatdown. Sting rushed to save Lashley from being beaten at sacrifice and since they can't find him anywhere in the building, maybe he'll come to their aid once more. They're not going to lay a finger on Bobby Lashley yet, but Sting had better make his appearance pretty quickly. Right on cue, the lights go down, the lure to get Sting to show his face has worked and we see a spotlight in the rafters revealing Sting in his favoured location. Sting tells the Kings of Wrestling that he hasn't been hiding but he's not surprised that they decided not to come to the place where they knew he'd be because he doesn't really believe that they want to get into it with him. He saw the look on Hero's face at sacrifice. Hero saw what he did to Jacobs and Black 
and he doesn't want to step in the ring with him. However, Sting will be in the ring at the beginning of Impact, the new era beginning with Sting coming out and he is calling out the Kings of Wrestling. He'll be ready for them. The lights then go out as we sign off on Impact with a very, very good segment and who bigger of a draw, the returning Sting will be in the middle of the ring. You will not want to miss next week's episode of Impact. Not only that, there is so much more planned of course. We gain heat to two storylines and I'm just really happy with that segment overall and a solid episode of Impact as well, increasing our popularity in 20 regions. We're seeing there that the growth was restricted even in America due to the limited number of viewers there, so that's something that hopefully we will be able to overcome. I'm not certain that this new network will cause that, but fingers crossed we will be in a better position going forward, and certainly in terms of the viewership ratings, if Evolve's anything to go by, we will be. Really happy with that as a follow-up to Sacrifice, but of course this week isn't over because we have Evolve airing two nights later on Saturday night. And the episode begins with Paul Heyman's big announcement as he tells viewers that the Evolve Championship will be introduced shortly. He doesn't give too much information away other than to reveal the design of the championship which he has beside him, beginning the storyline to crown the first Evolve Champion. And this is going to be defended basically like a TV title but on the Evolve show specifically. Kazuchika Okada then defeats Matt Jackson in the continuing rivalry between Sweet and Sour members, the Young Bucks and former members Okada and Yoshihashi. And after the match, Okada is attacked by both members of the Young Bucks. Yoshihashi attempts to make the save, but with Okada already down, he finds himself in a two-on-one situation. A double super kick lays him out as well before Larry Sweeney makes the challenge, Okada and Yoshihashi versus the Young Bucks and we'll get a response from Okada and Yoshihashi very soon I'm sure. We then get an interview with Jay Lethal who responds to Maria's revelation from Impact, it's just the camera in his face and he's basically trying to play it down. What Maria said isn't untrue but he knows they're going to come through this and be stronger. He's optimistic about the future despite the fact that everything is just going terribly for him recently. Kind of playing into what Maria said. He's not as happy-go-lucky and chipper as he once was but he's certainly not any closer to accepting the fact that he is in a bit of a crisis at the moment. We then get an episode of the Beautiful People show and they promote the best tag team in the world will be their guests. And of course it's themselves. At Sacrifice they retain the titles, they big themselves up, talk about how they even injured Hamada, that's how tough and legitimate they are. So just playing the obnoxious heels, winding everybody up intentionally. Hamada and Taylor Wilde then come out for their match and that basically calls an abrupt end to the Beautiful People show. Despite being injured, we do give them another win, a rebound from their pay-per-view defeat. And we're putting over Hamada here, working through the injury and still managing to pick up the victory with a Hamada driver. Wilde and Hamada putting in decent performances in an okay match. And after the match, they celebrate their victory. But we can clearly see there is a serious amount of injury to the ribs of Hamada. But credit to her for showing that toughness and getting through the match. In the back, we then have Paul Heyman speak to the beautiful people who he has called into their office and he's singing their praises. He loved that segment. He found it so hilarious, etc, etc. He tells them that they are a great tag team and he can't blame anybody for believing their own hype, but he wants to put that to the test at Slammiversary. Therefore, he will be inviting three teams from around the world to come to TNA and we'll see whether the beautiful people truly are the best tag team in the world. They will be TNA's representatives, so Heyman has high expectations of them. We then go into a decent main event. Rhett, Titus and Shelton Benjamin both off the game. That's really frustrating. I mean, Benjamin's still getting an 86 despite being off his game. And the idea here is that the All Night Express are kind of left to it. They let the side down, I suppose, at sacrifice. And while Austin Aries is on commentary for this match, hyping up and promoting his match with AJ Styles and Wrestling's Greatest Tag Team, he doesn't actually get involved and leaves All Night Express to lose and kind of putting across that Ares is punishing them. He's quite critical of them from the pay-per-view, critical of them tonight, and they clearly need to do something to get back into his good books. Wrestling's Greatest Tag Team then cut a promo directed at Austin Aries. They talk about this new era on the next episode of Impact. They admit that they're not as ingrained in the company as some of the other guys and they accept that but they feel at home in TNA straight away and they are ready to team with AJ Styles. Benjamin again struggling, but it's still a decent segment. I think because of that Paul Heyman promo at the start, we should be okay. Aries, of course, with a lot to say for himself, albeit off mic, just 
just creep into it being good enough. And with all the talk about those big plans, I should probably check to see whether I can actually go through and do this. Because it'd be kind of embarrassing if we end up just renewing with Spike and next week's New Era show being sort of pointless. We'll negotiate. We'll see if we can get ourselves a new deal for Impact. I did check this like last week, so there's no reason we shouldn't be fine. I'm going to sign it to a one-year deal. Can't get late evening, so it's going to have to be late night. But that's the slot that evolves in, and it gets really strong ratings compared to Impact. So I'm not going to worry about that. It is 15% to the company. That's all we can get. But what I'm mostly focused on is getting a deal where we are on a bigger network and that is the deal agreed it will start in a few days i also need to remember to get a deal for this in canada because spikes coverage i believe is us and canada yeah so i'll have to make sure but i'll do that off screen the key thing was getting impact on mtv and i think that new era show is going to be one of the best episodes we've done i do want to kind of try and replicate the feel that we had on the very first episode but at the same time showing how far we've come slammiversary in 23 days time beginning the build here tonight and it's only going to ramp up more and more you can see there's some decisions there i'm not going to click on that because we risk major major future spoilers with that as always thank you for watching and i'll be back with the next episode as soon as possible